minority leaders and the minority whip limited to five minutes each, but no event shall debate continue beyond 11.50 a.m. At this time, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Gutierrez, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I'm sending a letter to Colonel Alfred Pantano, the commander of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Jacksonville, Florida. The district oversees, among other things, the permitting process for the construction of a massive gas pipeline that will cross the mountains in Puerto Rico. The 92-mile gas pipeline, which does not make any sense environmentally, economically, or ethically, is moving forward in part because Colonel Pantano's office issued a draft environmental assessment that clearly favors the eventual issuance of the permit. I would like to read an expert from my letter. I was intensely angered, but not sadly, but not entirely surprised when I read the report issued by your office regarding the gasoducto in Puerto Rico. From the start, people in Puerto Rico have been telling me that they suspect all the regulatory oversight is nothing more than show, and this process has been assured of passage because insider cozy relationships because the, uh, between the Army Corps, Jacksonville staff, and the very industry they are supposed to be overseeing and regulating. Further, Having sunk millions of dollars in this project already, the ruling party in Puerto Rico's very credibility is at stake on this massive construction project moving forward. The draft environmental assessment is so slanted and flawed that it adds more evidence to the growing view that there is no meaningful oversight of this project by the federal government and no meaningful input from the residents of Puerto Rico. I believe your decision, Colonel Pantano, shows a complete disregard for compelling evidence demonstrating little need for this project. It shows disregard for the opinion of other federal agencies who have looked at the project. The decision disregards evidence of potential safety hazards to the people of Puerto Rico. This woefully slanted decision also gives credence to the suggestion of impropriety in matters related to this project and the inability of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to oversee this project. I believe this process should begin again in an open and transparent manner that the process that has led to the decision should be fully investigated and further efforts should be supervised by new leadership. I ask for the U.S. Army Office of Inspector General investigation immediately into the relationship between the government of Puerto Rico, the Army Corps of Engineers Jacksonville office, and the power companies and its contractors. Lobbyists who used to work for the Army Corps of Engineers should not be allowed to line their, line their pockets at the expense of the safety of the people of Puerto Rico. Your boss, President Obama, stated the cozy relationship between the regulators and the industry they regulate must come to an end. I strongly support the president and agree with him completely. However, my misgivings about the pipeline project multiplied substantially when the project was abruptly removed from Army Corps' office in Puerto Rico and transferred to the Jacksonville office in Florida. There is clearly a cozy relationship between the current Jacksonville staff that you supervise and the former Jacksonville staff who now supervises and works for the private company consulted by and hired by the government of Puerto Rico to lobby and provide technical assistance for the project. The result, the Army Corps of Engineers appears to have adopted all the power companies' wholesale arguments for moving forward. What a surprise. These include ignoring the advice of other federal agencies who do not seem to have any cozy connections and relationships to the moneyed interest behind the pipeline, including warnings from the Fish and Wildlife Service ignored, the Environmental Protection Agency ignored. Mr. Finally, I point out that it is an insult to the people of Puerto Rico to have, believed, to have released the Army Corps' report in the manner it was released. The report is exclusively in English, whereas the common language in Puerto Rico is Spanish. And English is a language that hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans whose lives will be directly affected by the pipeline do not speak and cannot read. How are they supposed to give advice and consent? It is also personally insulting that the 30-day comment period occurs during the holiday season when the residents of Puerto Rico are especially focused on their family. And interestingly enough, Congress will be in recess. The people of Puerto Rico, including those who live humbly in the mountains and those who have derived their livelihoods from the land, deserve a government that protects their interests. They deserve to know when their safety and way of life are threatened that the government will protect them. This case reveals the opposite. 
It reveals a government agency that ignores the warnings of other government agencies and a wealth of facts regarding safety, concerns, and environmental impact. It reveals a government agency that responds more to well-connected lobbyists than advocates for the people of Puerto Rico. It reveals a government agency that is doing nothing, not doing the job that it was mandated to do. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that this petition on behalf of many individuals, environmental groups from the Legal Assistant Clinic at the law school at the University of Puerto Rico to have the environmental assessment translated into English be submitted officially into the record. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Pistani, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder must resign immediately. After months of evading tough questions and giving unclear answers about Operation Fast and Furious, it now appears Justice Department's top official has contradicted his own testimony given before Congress. Under Operation Fast and Furious, the Bureau of Tobacco, Alcohol, and Firearms allowed straw purchasers to buy at least 1,400 weapons, despite the fact it knew that these weapons would likely end up in the hands of violent Mexican drug cartels. The ATF lost track of the guns after they were sold to criminals. Since then, many have been used in hundreds of crimes on both sides of the border, including murders of a border patrol agent in Arizona and an immigration officer at the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City. Why? did the Attorney General allow for the transfer of guns across the border without working in conjunction with Mexican authorities when he knew the ATF was unable to trace them? That's a very important question that must be answered. This botched program should never have been authorized in the first place. Attorney General Holder should resign over his failure and his evasive and contradictory testimony to the United States Congress. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Miller, for five minutes. Without objection. Mr. Speaker and members of the House, later today the House will consider the RAINS Act, which is legislation to design to make sure that in a Republican-controlled Congress no new regulations would be put into effect whether they deal with clean drinking water, clean air, child safety, the safety of children when they play with their toys, the drugs that, that so many citizens need to take to maintain their health, occupational safety, safety at the workplace, all of that would be destroyed under the RAINS Act. You might ask yourself, well, what would society look like? Well, we had a preview of what that society looks like yesterday when the Mine Safety and Health Administration released its report on the Upper Big Branch Mine. What that society looked like to those miners and to their families was 29 dead coal miners because the Massey Corporation was basically allowed to, by their board of directors, evade the basic regulations that were in place to protect the miners. Although the miners don't have protection of whistleblower, so we saw that Massey was able to intimidate the workers every day not to report safety violations, not to write up safety violations, not to report things that needed to be repaired because the chairman of the board told them the priority was the production of coal, not the safety of the workers. Produce the coal or get out is what he told them. So they were not able to participate in their own safety when they saw a violation or they saw a problem that could cause danger in the mine. They also were able to circumvent the right of, of the mine safety inspections in the mines because they gave advance warnings. They were told if a federal mine inspector comes onto the property, you must give advance warning to the people in the mine so they can divert the mine inspector away from the problems in the mine, take up their time while we can fix them, or he'll run out of time to inspect the mine. There's regulations against that. There's laws against that. They voided those. Then they kept two sets of books so that the mine regulators couldn't see the real level of violations in the mines. That's what it looks like when you don't have regulations. That's what it looks like when you don't have enforcement. And it's the conclusion of the mine safety report 
that mirrors one that was done by the state government. The conclusion is that the tragic death of 29 miners and serious injuries of two others in Upper Big Branch Mine were entirely preventable. Entirely preventable. Had regulations been enforced in that mine, had this company not been allowed to go rogue and ignore the regulations that are there to protect the miners' lives, we must now understand what that means to the American public, what it means to this family. What could have been contained, what could have been contained as a, a minor coal dust explosion or a localized methane gas explosion became an explosion that traveled 2,000 feet per second. 2,000 feet per second. There is no miner that could get out of the way of that act. And what happens at the end of that world without regulation, where you don't have to put up with paying fines, where you can clog the courts with appeals? When the Massey Company was sold, the board of directors that allowed this to happen, the executive officers that directed this to happen, walked away, the officers walked away with $90 million in bonuses, the board of directors walked away with $19 million in bonuses, and Don Blankenship, the CEO of the company that wrote the memo that said it's production of coal or get out, it's not safety, walked away with, with $86 million. And now get this, Don Blankenship, the CEO, now wants to go back into the coal business after killing 29 miners and whether it's the state of Virginia, the state of West Virginia, or Kentucky, or anywhere else, the suggestion is that they might be able to give him a permit to open up a mine. 29 miners are dead, violations of the law, a criminal corporate culture. And somebody else says that they might be able to go back into the mines. You will not reignite the American dream for workers in this country if you take away their rights at work. You will not reignite the American dream for the middle class if they have no rights at work, if they're subjected to this. For these families who lost the 29 members of their family, they're crushed. They're crushed. But you can't do that by eliminating the regulations. It's the regulations in place that have saved miners' lives, but it's the avoidance of the regulations, the ignoring of the regulations, and it's the failure of this Congress to introduce tough sanctions. When you obstruct a federal safety investigation, it should be a felony. Somebody should go to jail. When you obstruct the right of a worker to, 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 to blow the whistle on an unsafe procedure, there's got to be a strict fine for that. That's how we reignite the American dream. We've got a lot of work to do in this Congress. But you can't do it by stopping all regulations that protect our families, that protect our communities, that protect the workers in America today. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, the sun was lazily rising on the horizon. It was around breakfast time on a stunning Sunday morning. It was quiet, peaceful, calm. People felt secure. There was a small tropical breeze as the American flag was being raised on a nearby flagpole. It was this day that Luke Trahan, a 22-year-old sailor from southeast Texas, noticed large formations of aircraft darkening the glistening sky. He kept watching in awe until suddenly the aircraft broke formation, dove from the sky, and unleashed a fury of deadly devastating bombs and torpedoes on a place called Pearl Harbor in the Pacific. It was this day, 70 years ago this morning, when Luke and his fellow sailors, soldiers, and Marines saw war unleashed upon America. It was December 7, 1941. The Japanese had caught America by surprise and took advantage of an unprepared nation. And after the smoke cleared on that morning of madness, 98 Navy planes and 64 Army aircraft were destroyed. Luke's unit, Patrol Wing 1, lost all but three of its 36 aircraft. 2,471 Americans, servicemen and civilians, were killed by this unwarranted invasion of terror from the skies. The pride of the United States Navy, the battleships, West Virginia, California, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Utah, Maryland, Nevada, and Arizona were trapped in the harbor. They made easy targets for the Japanese pilots. The sailors on board these battle wagons fought with the courage of an entire legion of warriors when they were attacked by skillful, fanatical, 
and tyrannical enemy. All of, the, all of these fierce U.S. Navy battleships were sunk or damaged. Their guns, Mr. Speaker, are now silent. The hull of the USS Arizona became the sacred graveyard in the peaceful Pacific for more than 1,177 American sailors and Marines. I have seen, Mr. Speaker, the oil that still seeps to the surface from the hull of the battleship Arizona. Luke Trahan and his Navy buddies in Patrol Wing 1 quickly got organized, prepared, and waited for two days for the expected land invasion by the Japanese. It never came. But America was at war. It was World War II, and the war was long. It spread from the Pacific to Europe to Africa to the Middle East to Asia. The Japanese, then the Nazis, seemed undefeatable. But even the Japanese were concerned about the spirit of America. The Japanese commander of Pearl Harbor invasion remarked that Japan and what it had done was wake a sleeping giant. World War II was hard. Millions served in uniform overseas. Millions served on the home front. All sacrificed for the cause of America. The nation woke from a somber sleep of neutrality and with our allies defeated the tyrants that would rule the world. That was a time when Americans put aside all differences and united to defend freedom and our nation. Mr. Speaker, I'm always intrigued by the stories of those war heroes and the folks of that generation. There isn't one of them that cannot recall the exact moment and place they were when they heard the news of Pearl Harbor. Both of my parents, barely teenagers at the time, still talk about what they were doing when they heard on the radio that broadcast that Sunday morning about the invasion. Until September 11th, this was the deadliest attack on American soil. December 7th, 1941, a date that will live in infamy. Those were the words of President Franklin Roosevelt that for, became forever embedded in the minds of patriots across our land, igniting and launching a nation into the fiery trenches of battle throughout the world. Those of that greatest generation proved that when freedom of this nation is threatened, our people will stand and fight. They'll bring the thunder of God upon our enemies. Defending freedom and liberty was the battle cry of the sailors, marines, and soldiers that died 70 years ago at Pearl Harbor. We remember December 7, 1941, and the Americans who stood tall and kept the flame of America burning brightly. They were a remarkable bunch of people. They were the Americans. My friend, Petty Officer Luke Trahan, stayed in the United States Navy 38 years, either on active or reserve status. He wore his uniform every Memorial Day, every Veterans Day, and spent a lot of time speaking proudly about this country. He died four years ago on December 5, 2007. He was 89 years of age. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the general, general lady from Ohio, Ms. Fudge, for five minutes. Without, uh, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to address the urgent need to extend unemployment insurance for struggling Americans. 45% of all unemployed workers, more than 6 million people, have been out of work for more than six months. Karen from Cleveland was laid off in March. She was laid off from a law firm due to budget constraints. She is 62 years old and un unable to find a job in this economy. Unemployment insurance is helping her to get by with just the basic necessities. It is allowing her to pay for expensive but necessary prescriptions. She is actively looking for work, but she's afraid that if, she, if her unemployment benefits are cut, she will lose her house. Karen's state unemployment benefits can run out at the end of December. If Congress fails to act to renew the federal unemployment insurance program, she'll become just another statistic one of the millions of Americans who identify themselves with the 99 percent. Karen, along with six million Americans, will be cut off from emergency lifeline-saving resources unless Congress acts. Sandra of Cleveland Heights lost her job in April 2011. It's her third layoff. She is 59 years old. She never thought she would find herself in this position at this age. Rather than defaulting on her mortgage, she has used up all of her retirement savings. Now she is deeper into debt. 
When her unemployment funds run out, it's likely she will default. And being an older worker, it makes it even harder. We see this scenario all too often across this nation. Hardworking Americans getting laid off, using up their savings, and then losing their homes. We've seen foreclosure rates soar, and Americans are falling behind on their mortgage payments at a very rapid rate. In my district, more than 13 percent of homeowners are 90 or more days behind in their mortgage. In 2010, unemployment benefits kept 3 million Americans, including nearly 1 million children, from falling into poverty. Extending unemployment insurance could prevent the loss of over 500,000 jobs according to the Economic Policy Institute. 500,000 jobs. You know why? Because UI payments go directly into the economy. They support local businesses. They help create jobs and reduce the demand for public services. If we don't extend unemployment insurance, it would be the equivalent of pulling nearly $90 billion out of the economy in 2012. There's one more story I'd like to tell you. It's from Mali in Toledo. I tell Molly's story because it embodies the frustration felt by thousands upon thousands of Americans across this country. Molly has battled unemployment since October 2008. She wonders how the rich and powerful expect people like her to survive without good paying jobs. Are we just supposed to die, she asks? Commit suicide? Starve to death while we are homeless and on the streets? Molly says the deck really seems to be stacked against ordinary Americans. No one with any real power seems to care, except Warren Buffett. I'm trying to find a good job, she says, or any job for that matter. We, the unemployed, are demonized by the right and discriminated against for being out of work. We're too old or overqualified or underqualified or we're the wrong color. What has happened to my country, she asks. These are the stories of everyday Americans who are struggling to get by. This is not about Democrats and Republicans. This is about coming together to help millions of unemployed Americans get through the worst economic recession since the Great Depression. It's about helping our economy grow and about creating jobs. Americans are frustrated with the decline of the middle class and the lack of good paying jobs. But these honorable citizens haven't given up and neither can we. We must act now. We must extend unemployment insurance. I, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Jones, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, when we were home during the Thanksgiving break, like all my colleagues, uh, I did as much as I could uh, to be with the people of the 3rd District of North Carolina. The 3rd District is the home of Camp Lejeune Marine Base, Cherry Point Marine Air Station, and Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, and over 60,000 retired veterans in the 3rd District. Since coming back to Washington, I've done two town meetings by phone, what I heard while I was home during Thanksgiving and the two town meetings. Why are we still in Afghanistan? When I hear my colleagues in both parties talking about the problems facing the American people, unemployment benefits, uh, extending the tax cuts for the middle class America, and uh, you know, we're all grappling, both parties, how are we going to pay for it? Well, there's a man in Afghanistan that is a crook and corrupt who gets $10 billion a month and he doesn't have to worry about it. The poor Americans are out here doing the best they can in a very difficult economy. And we can't help them, but we can help a corrupt leader in Afghanistan. It makes no sense. I hope that this Congress will come together and say to the President, let's not wait to 2014. How many more American boys and girls will have to die and give their legs in the next three years for a corrupt leader? I've asked the Department of Defense, and I wrote Secretary Panetta, and asked him that question. Give me your projections of how many more young men and women will have to die and lose their legs. I hope that I get that response soon. That brings me to the point of a young Marine I saw at Walter Reed Bethesda about three weeks ago. There were four Marines from the 3rd District of North Carolina Three had lost both legs, and the one that had lost only one leg, a corporal, mom sitting in the room, 
said to me, sir, may I ask you a question? I said, certainly you may. Why are we still in Afghanistan? And I looked at him and I said, I don't know why we're still there. Mr. Speaker, it makes no sense. The American people and the people of the 3rd District of North Carolina are saying we have won. Bin Laden is dead. Al-Qaeda has been dispersed all over the world. Mr. Speaker, it is time as we debate these very difficult, complex issues for our nation that we get smart with our foreign policy. And smart means let's don't try to police the world. History has proven you will never change Afghanistan. It will never change, no matter what we do or any other country tries to do. So, Mr. Speaker, beside me is a poster with a flag draped coffin coming off the plane at Dover. And with humility, I tell you today, Mr. Speaker, I've signed over 10,400 letters to families and extended families who've lost loved ones in Afghanistan and Iraq. I thank God that he has allowed me to have a heart large enough to feel the pain of war because I've never been to war. But when I sign those letters, I feel the pain of the families. And I lick every envelope that I send. Mr. Speaker, with that, I want to close my comments by asking God to please bless our men and women in uniform. God, to please bless the families who've lost loved ones fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq. God, please bless the House and Senate that we will do what's right for the American people. Bless Mr. Obama that he will do what is right for the American people. And three times I will say, God, please, God, please, God, please continue to bless America. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Ellison, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, before I begin my remarks, I want to publicly associate myself with everything Walter Jones just said. He is absolutely right. Mr. Speaker, this holiday season, Congress has chances, a couple of chances, right in front of them to do what's right for the American people and to side with the overwhelming percentage of Americans suffering out there in this economy. For an entire year, the majority in the House has not offered a single bill to create a single job. In fact, the only thing that the Congress has been doing is creating an environment where public sector jobs are cut and where private sector jobs, though they have been growing, are offset by those public sector cuts, leaving us with an unemployment rate which we're happy to have at 8.6 percent, but, but within the historical context, is still a national disgrace and an outrage to have unemployment at 8.6 percent for so very long. But we're happy to have it because it has been as high as 10. And now we're threatening to leave more than 2 million Americans, including, including 13,000 in my home state of Minnesota, out in the cold during the holiday season by taking away that, their unemployment insurance. Right now, 14 million people are unemployed and companies really aren't hiring. For most of these people, unemployment insurance is the only thing that's keeping them in their homes and out and not out on the street. According to the Census Bureau, unemployment insurance has pulled 3.2 million Americans out of poverty last year. And that's why Congress needs to make sure that all Americans, Mr. Speaker, continue to have this vital lifeline available. Any credible economist will tell you that unemployment insurance creates jobs. Every dollar invested in unemployment insurance yields a return of $1.52 in economic growth. At least 200,000 jobs would be lost if Congress fails to ex the, pass the extension of unemployment insurance benefits. Congress must not leave Washington for the holidays without extending unemployment benefits that create jobs and put money into the pockets and on the tables of millions of Americans. Uh, Republicans, both Democrat and Republican uh, politicians, uh, we together have not passed that jobs bill. While the Republicans are in the majority, and I believe bear 
the weight of the responsibility. It's a responsibility of every member of Congress to call for the extension of unemployment insurance benefits and jobs at this critical time. America can't wait. We shouldn't be leaving hardworking Americans high and dry this holiday season. This holiday season, we can spur economic growth, create jobs, and strengthen the middle class by doing the right thing of extending unemployment insurance benefits. On behalf of the good people who played by the rules and lost their jobs because of Wall Street greed, and while this majority looked the other way, I urge all of my colleagues to support the extension of unemployment insurance benefits. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kinzinger, for five minutes. Well, I thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. There's been a lot of talk uh, lately about Afghanistan. Uh, you, you hear it every day. You heard it just a little bit ago about why are we in Afghanistan? What are we fighting for? Isn't it time to go home? And I've got to tell you, the easy thing to do is to stand up and say, let's just declare victory and let's leave. And then whatever happens after we're gone, it's not our fault anymore. It's not our problem. That's the easy thing to do. You know, the America I grew up in and continue to grow up in and live in is not the country that always picks the easy thing. The thing about the American DNA is I believe we do, typically, the right thing. Now let me tell you, I'm a, still a pilot in the military. I still fly for the Air National Guard and have had the privilege and honor of serving overseas with my fellow men and women in uniform. Although most of my experience was in Iraq, I remember in Iraq a time when members of this House stood up and said that the war in Iraq is lost, that there's no way to win, and it's time to just come home. And we see today that now the American troops are coming home from Iraq, but under a condition of victory. And while I have concerns about that timetable for withdrawal, I think anybody would agree that that's better than had we just in 2006 and 2007 folded up and taken the easy way. So let me ask my fellow members of Congress and let me ask the American people, what is it we're fighting for in Afghanistan? And I have here a very disturbing but a very appropriate picture of what it is that we're fighting for. The young girl you see on the top, her name is Bibi. Bibi is 17 years old. When Bibi was 12 years old, she was sold to somebody basically as a slave as a result of a member of her family committing a crime and selling her as reparations for that crime. For five years, she was beaten by her husband until one day she decided to run away to seek freedom. Well, she was caught. Her husband caught her, drug her back to his house, and the Taliban, as a way to enact justice, forced him, with his brother holding her down, forced him to cut off her nose and to cut off her ears. She then proceeded to basically crawl to her uncle's house, and her uncle ignored her. And somebody finally called the hospital and they said, go to an American Ford operating base, they'll take care of you. And you hear the stories of the major who took care of her talking about how she showed up and talking about the fright that she had in her eyes. I took a trip to Afghanistan recently and saw a village where a man was standing on a berm with an AK-47. And I talked to him through a translator and he informed me that not two days ago, his daughter fell into a well and drowned. But yet he still believes that his village needs protecting. And he could be sitting at home mourning the loss of his daughter, and I'm sure he mourned the loss, but he was standing out defending his village. Because he wants what Americans want, what anybody around the world wants. They want security. They want to be able to raise their family. Bibi just wants to live her life without being beaten and sold into slavery. Today, because of the American presence in Afghanistan and those of our coalition partners, you see the picture at the bottom of this, the best part of this picture, and that is girls in school learning to read and write, learning that there's a world out there, 
learning that despite where they were raised and born, they too can have some of the freedoms and some of the privileges that folks in the rest of the world, and especially in the United States, have. So let me say this. It is so easy to stand up and say, this is not worth it. But I'm going to tell you, the second verse of the Star Spangled Banner has a line that says, O conquer we must, when our cause, it is just. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're doing in Afghanistan is not extending an empire. It's bringing freedom to millions of people, taking out jihadists that would believe that they would kill people simply because you believe differently than them. And we are standing up for freedom around the globe. The greatest disinfectant to terrorism is freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, the fight in Afghanistan, though difficult, is worth it. And I commend today and stand up and say God bless you to those that have gone over there and put on the uniform. And I say thank you for your service to your country. The fight is worth it. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Rangel, for five minutes. Without objection. I have been so moved by the preceding gentleman's remarks about the good work that Americans uh, can do, especially when the argument is which side are we on, terrorism or freedom. I don't know how many cases in the world that the United States of America can intercede in. But I do know that as we see these horrible examples of what people can do to their own people, that we have thousands of Americans that have volunteered to support our flag and the integrity of the United States who have been killed. And it just seemed to me that when we're talking about the protection of a human body, whether it's losing a limb or your sight or your face, no matter what it is, and especially your life, that if America is going to take this position, all Americans should be prepared to make the sacrifices as the gentleman before me has. I think it's so unfair, and borders on corrupt. When people talk about where our American men and women should be defending freedom in foreign countries, when America hasn't spoken, presidents haven't declared war, and we find ourselves talking about volunteers when it's abundantly clear that everybody does not assume the same sacrifices, whether we're talking about taxes or loss of life. And so what are we talking about Australia, Afghanistan, Iraq, before the people make a decision, and that's what we're for in the House, before they make the decision, at least say that everyone has to participate in that decision and not those who for economic reasons find themselves in communities with the highest, the very highest unemployment. And I laud what happens to all of us who volunteered because when that flag goes up, you salute the flag. The president becomes the commander in chief and there's only one thing to do and that's win and protect the integrity of the United States. But I submit that we have to have a draft that's a part of what? The United States and not a plea for those people for economic reasons will have to protect themselves. I don't think I've ever said this before, but I was thinking that my brother volunteered long before Pearl Harbor, which today we commemorate, and so he was unable to say, nor I, that he volunteered because we were being attacked. But several years later in 1948, when the war was over, I volunteered. And that was before the North Koreans invaded South Korea. I would like to walk away saying how patriotic we both were. But really what motivated me was the excitement my mother would get in receiving a check for my older brother. 
And it wasn't a question of whether she loved him more. It was that she needed it. I was a, a teenager, 11, 12 years old. And one thing I knew, I wanted to make my mother as happy as my brother did and send her that allotment check. And yet today, I have medals and I've been lauded uh, by Koreans and everyone else. But when I think about it, it was economic reasons that made me a, quote, hero. And it's economic reasons that make the heroes that we have that defend our country and our flag so well. So I didn't expect to talk about that, but hearing that 70 years ago, we were attacked and the American lives that were lost and then coming back to what has happened in Afghanistan, I am reminded of how unfair this system is for the greatest country in the world and the hope and the vision that, that we're losing and what separates us from so many other countries where you can be born in the pits of poverty and yet you can always dream that in this great country that you can succeed. So many members of Congress and so many members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus are the first ones that ever went to college. Or their parents were the first ones in generations that were able to become professionals. And then the great honor to represent the United States of America in this Congress. Well, I yield back the balance of my time and I'm sorry to have deviated from why I came to the well, but I can say as other members have, God bless America, we have to keep fighting for equality and justice for all. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, legislation that I sponsored along with Senator Michael Bennett from Colorado passed the House floor. This bill for the Blue Star Mothers of America updated their congressional charter for the modern era. Mr. Speaker, I am privileged today, particularly on this day, as we commemorate the attack on Pearl Harbor 70 years ago, to be able to rise to honor the Blue Star Mothers of America, people, women of America, who've been providing much needed assistance to our nation's active duty service men and women, veterans, and military families since 1942. Founded during the height of World War II, the Blue Star Mothers are a nonpartisan veteran service organization composed of mothers of current and former service members. Today, over 5,000 dedicated women perform a wide variety of important volunteer services for our troops, providing transportation, supplies, food, and emotional support. More than 225 local chapters across the United States carry out the mission of supporting our troops, our veterans, and the families of our fallen heroes, as well as developing individual projects to assist specific needs of the military in their own communities. Last month alone, thousands of care packages were sent to our troops overseas, and chaplains, commanders across the military received boxes of supplies and gifts to be able to be distributed to their comrades. The Blue Strong Mothers were originally formed to bring their children home, to ensure that they were given benefits that they deserved, and to provide them with a vast support network upon their arrival. The organization has since expanded to include other forms of assistance, including rehabilitation, family services, and civil defense. This was chartered by Congress in 1960. Mr. Speaker, it is an honor to be able to recognize the Blue Star Mothers of America, and I rise today to thank these patriotic women for their commitment to serving the needs of America's military community and for making the difference in the lives of those who sacrifice the most. Mr. Speaker, several years ago, I had the opportunity to be at the graduation of the United States Air Force Academy. My son-in-law was graduating and Secretary Gates delivered the commencement address. At that time, he noted that that freshman class was the first to enter the academy after 9-11, knowing full well that they would be putting themselves in harm's way. We have the finest volunteer military that the world has ever seen. 
May God continue to bless this country with such men and women who will always stand for freedom. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California. Sorry, we have the order wrong here. I'll re uh, repeat that. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Kappa, for five minutes. I thank the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I apologize to Mike. Blake. <laughs> Numerous stories have come out during the last few weeks, no, all detailing corruption and outright fraud on Wall Street. First, there was the recent news about the former Secretary of Treasury, Hank Paulson, inappropriately tipping a few key friends from Goldman Sachs and other Wall Street tycoons about the impending collapse of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, so those friends could make money on that insider knowledge. Then, a federal judge in New York threw out one of the orchestrated settlements between Citigroup, which was at the center of the wrongdoing, and the Securities and Exchange Commission that allowed that bank to walk away from cases of fraud without admitting any wrongdoing. This past weekend, 60 Minutes interviewed a former executive vice president at Countrywide Financial, a giant and duplicitous player in the U.S. mortgage business. This woman was in charge of fraud investigations at the company before the financial crisis. According to her, countrywide loan officers were forging and manipulating borrowers' income and asset statements to help them get loans they weren't qualified for and couldn't afford. She went on to say, all of the recycle bins, wherever we looked in that company, um, were full of signatures that had been cut off of one document and put onto another and then photocopied or faxed. According to her, the fraud she witnessed was systemic, taking place in Boston, Chicago, Miami, Detroit, Las Vegas, Phoenix, and elsewhere. She was fired before she could speak to government regulators about the extent of fraud she had documented. What is most troubling is that these stories are not isolated. The FBI testified before Congress as early as 2004 that they were seeing an epidemic in white-collar crime. They stated the FBI did not have anywhere near enough agents to investigate the financial crisis. There are moments when I do wonder if the FBI has the will to prosecute, but still today the FBI has nowhere near enough special agents or forensic experts to properly investigate the level of corruption that we know occurred. Frankly, the Congress has shorted the FBI, some might say purposefully, of the resources they need to do the job. I have a bill, uh, and I invite my colleagues to support H.R. 3050, the Financial Crisis Criminal Investigation Act, authorizing an additional 1,000 FBI agents to aggressively investigate the kind of fraud that has destroyed the economic future of millions of our people and upset the global financial system. Back when we had the SNL crisis in the 1990s, we had 1,000 agents. You know how many there were working when this started? 45. 45. We're only up a little over 200. Think about that, America. Why do you think these people aren't in jail? Frankly, this Congress has not taken its responsibility seriously. Despite robust public reporting of misdeeds on Wall Street, it was not until the MF Global case, one of the top 10 bankruptcies in this country, that Congress has shown some mild interest in the magnitude of the inquiry required. In November, we got an inside look into the stunning misdeeds, and let's be blunt, outright thievery that occurred at MF Global in the days before it declared bankruptcy. The total amount missing from private accounts has fluctuated over the weeks. As much as $1.2 billion could be missing from private customer accounts. Congress is finally having hearings on this subject tomorrow, and we'll see how seriously investigation is pursued. Let me say the public has a right to know on what specific dates throughout 2011 money from customer accounts was wire transferred in order to meet MF Global's margin calls. This is the key question. Members should ask, probe, and exact the truth. The public has a right to know on what specific dates through 2011 was money from private customer accounts at MF wire transferred in order to meet MF's global margin calls. If Mr. Corzine authorized the taking of those funds, then this body should remind him that no one is above the law, not even someone who is a former Goldman Sachs CEO, former governor, and U.S. senator. Whichever friends and associates 
aided his actions in that company should be brought into full sunlight as well as other companies that were likely involved in those wire transfers. The fact that hundreds of millions of dollars, if not over a billion dollars, can simply be stolen from a major banking institution from the inside requires full investigation, not just by the Congress, but by the FBI. I'm reminded of that book written by Professor William Black, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. Well, I wonder how much of that applies in this case. It's time that Wall Street white-collar crimes be prosecuted seriously, that this Congress do its job, give the FBI the resources it needs to fully investigate and prosecute, and the committees of this chamber use their full authority to do no less. Mr. Speaker, I yield back my remaining time. The gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to uh, speak today about the regulations from executive in need of scrutiny, or the RAINS Act. This bill, which I have co-sponsored, restores accountability to the regulatory process by requiring an up or down vote in Congress and the President's signature on any new major rule before it is enforced on the American people. Overregulation, Mr. Speaker, is devastating our economy and hindering job growth. Of the current administration's new regulations, 200 are expected to cost more than $100 million each. Seven of those new regulations, however, will cost the economy more than $1 billion each. At the current pace, the total regulatory burden for 2011 alone will exceed $105 billion. And the federal government has created more than 81.9 million hours worth of paperwork this year alone, costing employers $80 billion just in compliance. It's no wonder a recent Gallup poll found small business owners citing complying with government regulations, quote unquote, as the most important problem they face. Nebraskans have not been immune to the reams of red tape being handed down by federal regulators. Just yesterday, it was reported the city of Grand Island, Nebraska, population 51,000, will be saddled with a $3.2 million compliance cost due to a new federal emissions regulation. This EPA cross-state air pollution rule was finalized June 1st and will be enforced January 1st. But this is only one example. There are additional, even more costly rules and unworkable timelines coming down the pike, all of which mean a much longer winter for Americans struggling with high energy costs. But it doesn't stop there. Recently, the Department of Labor proposed a misguided rule which would restrict youth involvement in agriculture work. Yes, Mr. Speaker, anything from milking cows and feeding calves to hauling hay and detasseling corn would come under fire under the department's current rule. Everyone agrees the safety of these young people and workers everywhere is of the utmost importance. But by allowing such heavy-handed, thoughtless regulation, we're greatly restricting opportunities for rural youth. These jobs, often seasonal, teach young people responsibility and the value of hard work, and they're able to earn a little spending money in the process. I'm also a, a proud co-sponsor of the Farm Dust Regulation Prevention Act of 2011, H.R. 1633, which the House is slated to consider this week. This bill would prevent the EPA from regulating farm dust or the type of dust which naturally occurs in rural areas. Farmers and ranchers already are subject to strict federal and state regulations to control dust. It makes no sense for the EPA to impose costlier requirements on top of the existing standards. While the EPA has backed off without legislative action, nothing certainly prohibits the agency from regulating farm dust in the future. During a time of economic hardship, keeping the door open for additional regulatory overreach is not the answer. Actually, I'm uh, often reminded of a meeting I had in southeastern Nebraska with representatives from a federal agency. Good people they are. One of them said it had been more than 20 years since he'd ridden on a gravel road. For me, this meeting certainly emphasized the disconnect between Washington and rural America. These are only a few examples of the regulatory burden and uncertainty facing Nebraskans who recognize economic growth ultimately depends on job creators, not regulators. Mr. Speaker, I encourage my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support common sense regulatory reforms like the RAINS Act. This is yet another step toward increased accountability, improving the regulatory process, and providing certainty for job creators in my home state of Nebraska, but it's in states all across the country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back. The gentleman yields back.
The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Woolsey, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, the violence rages on in Afghanistan. Earlier this week, suicide bombers struck in three different cities, in each case targeting Shiite worshipers who are observing a religious holiday. The death toll is at least 63, according to a news report, and a Pakistani extremist group has claimed responsibility for the attacks. One eyewitness told the New York Times, he said, and I quote him, he said, we saw 30 or 40 people on the ground missing arms and legs. Another said the Kabul blast was timed to wreck the maximum havoc as the bomber detonated at the moment that the crowd was largest, when one group was going into the mosque and another was exiting. In the 10 years of this war, it's the first attack specifically against Shiites, adding a sectarian angle and religious tension that didn't and hadn't previously been prevalent in the Afghanistan conflict. Mr. Speaker, how can we call our occupation of Afghanistan a success when after 10 years, attacks like this are, and, and uh, making a young woman like Bibi that was uh, talked about on the other side of the aisle earlier this morning makes her victimization and her terrorization commonplace. When this is commonplace, it, we cannot be having success in Afghanistan. The truth is, our continued military presence is aggravating the violence, not containing it, and certainly not stopping it. I'm not saying that Afghanistan will be magically transformed when the last of our troops leaves, but our best hope for peace, for security, and stability there is a swift end to this war. But here's another important thing, Mr. Speaker. If we do this right and, and uh, have an end to the war that is meaningful, we would, it would mean the beginning of an even more robust engagement with Afghanistan, an engagement based on the principles of smart security. In other words, a peaceful partnership based on mutual respect assistance to strengthening Afghanistan's democratic infrastructure, not with military force, but with civilian support. A smart security would empower the Afghan people, investing in their hopes and dreams, instead of bringing further violence to their country. Military redeployment out of Afghanistan can't and won't mean a complete withdrawal from Afghanistan. So I hope that every single one of my colleagues who has eagerly rubber-stamped war spending year after year, even while complaining about uh, the United States budget deficits, will show the same enthusiasm and the same support for a humanitarian surge in Afghanistan. I have to shake my head, Mr. Speaker, every time I hear someone say, we can't afford such generous foreign aid. Talk about penny wise and pound foolish. Last fiscal year, we spent roughly $2.5 billion on development assistance in Afghanistan. Mr. Speaker, we go through that much war spending in Afghanistan every single week. The bottom line is that smart investments provide more security at a fraction of the cost, pennies on the dollar compared to waging war. Allowing extreme poverty and widespread unemployment to prevail throughout Afghanistan imperils our national security as much as anything else. Where there's hopelessness, that's where insurgents get a foothold. Nothing breeds terrorism like hardship, deprivation, and despair. Mr. Speaker, because it's the right thing to do and because it's the best way to protect America, Let's bring our troops home.